ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه اما بعد يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله واحسن الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار ثم اما بعد الحمد لله على نعمه الاسلام والسنه حدثني جماعه من الشيوخ باسناد كل الى سفيان بن عيينه عن عمرو بن دينار عن ابي قابوس عن عبد الله بن عمرو بن عاص رضي الله تعالى عنهما ان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الرحمون يرحمهم الرحمن ارحموا من في الارض يرحمكم من في السماء قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم in this tremendous hadith and this is after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending the salutations and exhortations upon the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asking allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise his mention and to grant peace upon him the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentions in this tremendous hadith that those who are merciful they will be shown mercy by the most merciful to be merciful to those who are in the earth and the one who is above the heavens he will show you mercy this hadith is a hadith that is tremendous and it's from those ahadith musalsal bil awwaliyya it is from those narrations that the scholars of hadith the imams of hadith the imams of the past they used to and even still today many of the teachers many of the ulama they teach this hadith to their students traditionally is called it's from the hadith al musalsal bil awwaliyya because this will be the first hadith in which they would teach to their pupils because it's tremendous and it outlines the manner of knowledge the purpose of knowledge and the goal of knowledge the nature of it and how one who is a carrier of it should carry themselves the prophet sallallahu sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that those who are merciful those who show mercy those who are merciful to others those who show others mercy then the most merciful meaning allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ar-rahman he will show them mercy so therefore be merciful to those who are in the earth and the one who is above the heavens he will show you mercy many 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 benefits in this hadith this hadith could be a class all by itself or a number of classes all by itself ala kulli hal the ulama they would teach this to their pupils because as the the ulama they mention al ilm rahma knowledge is mercy ghayatuhu rahma fi dunya wa natijatu afwan natijatuhu rahma fi dunya wa ghayatuhu rahma fi al akhirah that the result of knowledge is mercy the result of knowledge is mercy from the fruits of knowledge is that one he will be merciful upon people 
He'll be forbearance. He'll be tolerant of the indecency and of the harms that individuals they will show him. And we know this is from the case that anyone who gives da'wah, anyone who calls to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're going to be harmed. And thus the ulama they mention, وَالصَّبْرُ عَلَىٰ عَذَافِهِ وَالصَّبْرُ عَلَىٰ عَذَافِهِ And to be patient upon the harms that one will encounter while giving knowledge, while teaching knowledge, and calling others to that which is correct, while calling to good and forbidding evil. Not everyone is going to like that. You're going to be forbidding evil from, a, from people who perhaps may want to do the evil. So therefore, their response will be to harm you in some way. Whether that harm is verbal, whether that harm is physical. They're going to try to harm you in some way, some shape or some form. Those who are malicious and, and intent upon doing this evil and don't like the fact that you are highlighting that this is evil and warning the people from it. Likewise, for the callers of evil, their supporters, they would rally to their defense and they will attack you with all types of malicious attacks in defense of an individual who's calling to misguidance. So you have to have sabr and you have to, you have to show and display this type of mercy to the creation. The one who has knowledge, this is incumbent that they carry themselves in a manner that is befitting. The end result of knowledge, the ultimate goal of knowledge is to receive mercy in the hereafter. To receive mercy in the hereafter. Because knowledge should be a means by way in which an individual he strives to go to the heaven. It should not be a cause by way in which an individual will be plunged into hell. And those individuals who will be plunged into hell because of some knowledge that they have with them, it is as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Quran hujjatun laka aw alayk. And the Quran will be a proof for you or a proof against you. It will be a proof against you if you learn it, if you memorize it, if you study it, if you know its meanings, and then you don't live in accordance to it. You live in a manner that is contrary to it. You call people to good, but you don't do it. You call people to stay away from evil, yet you yourself are indulging in it. Then this would be a way in which an individual, they would have destroyed themselves. Although they may have given light to others, they may have benefited others, but then ultimately they destroy themselves. Knowledge in its proper way and the way in which an individual should carry themselves, it should be a source of mercy, both here in this world and in the next world. Like I said, this could be a class all by itself. But bithni lahi ta'ala, I digress. We continue going over the tremendous book, the 40 hadith of Imam al nawawi rahimahullahu ta'ala. We have reached the hadith an Abi Hurairah radiyallahu ta'ala anhu qal, qal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inna Allah ta'ala qal on the authority of Abu Hurairah radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he said that the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said that verily Allah the most high said so this is a hadith that is Qudsi. We'll come back to this bithni lahi ta'ala and speak more about that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, مَنْ عَادَ لِي وَلِيًّا فَقَدْ آذَنْتُهُ بِالْحَرْبِ Allah ta'ala, he says, what means, whoever has enmity for a wali of mine, and bithni lahi ta'ala, we're going to leave it like that, untranslated, wali. Whoever has enmity and shows enmity to a wali of mine, then I have openly proclaimed war against them. There's an open declaration of war. This is not a type of war that you ever want declared upon you. Because this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declaring war upon you. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares war upon you, there is no means of victory for you. You will never be able to be victorious, but you will be defeated and destroyed every single time. So we have to be mindful of what we do and what we say. But we'll come back to this. ta'ala. We'll go sentence by sentence. ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he goes on to say, in this hadith al-Qudsi, مَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبَدِي 
بشيء أحب إلي مما نفترضت عليه Allah Ta'ala, he says with me, and never does my slave draw close unto me with anything more beloved to me than that which I have made obligatory upon them. I want us all to listen very closely. This hadith is so tremendous because it highlights and it reiterates because we had this meaning has come as far as the importance of the obligatory deeds has come early in the book. But now we gain some understanding in another aspect, another angle of the importance of the establishment of the obligatory affairs is that there is nothing more beloved to Allah than that the slave, he does that which Allah has commanded him to do, those obligatory deeds. So I want us to really think about this because this is a, 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 an issue that some of the Muslims, they are unaware of and they are very lackadaisical as it relates to them. So when it comes to their obligatory prayers, for example, you may have an individual they are very lax as it relates to them. They don't establish them like they should be establishing them. Now, but if you knew, if you remembered, if it was on your mind that the most beloved thing to Allah is that his slave does that which he commands him to do, that which is obligatory. This will motivate you to do what? To find out exactly what are all the things that are obligatory upon you. And then to find out how did the Prophet وسلم, command us to do these things? What is the prophetic guidance on how we are to carry out these particular affairs? So that we learn them inside and out. Why? So that we can do them. Why? Because we are striving to gain the love of Allah. We are striving to gain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a means by way in which to do that. And that is to do what? To establish what is obligatory. So the establishment of what is obligatory, that comes first. But inshallah ta'ala, we'll come back to this. Allah ta'ala goes on to say in his hadith al-Qudsi, وَلَا يَزَالُ عَبَدِي يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِلْ حَتَّى أُحِبَّهُ And my slave, he will continuously keep doing the voluntary. He will continue, I want you to understand this. He will continuously keep doing and establishing the obligatory and adding to the obligatory the voluntary as well. Naam. Okay, I want you to understand this. Because doing the voluntary without establishing the obligatory is not going to benefit you. Okay? For example, the voluntary prayers, they will cover up the deficiencies from the obligatory prayers. So they, they're going to make up and fill in the gaps and deficiencies from the obligatory prayer. So if we were to give an example, it is like a patch to a thelb. A patch to a thelb. It, it gets a hole in it, you put a patch upon it. Now, it gets a tear, you put a patch upon it. Okay, so I want you to look at it as if the voluntary are the patches. What benefit could a patch do if there's no thobe there to begin with? There's no thobe there to begin with. So what is a patch? How beneficial really is a patch? That you have a patch. You don't have a thobe. So what are you going to patch? So the obligatory affairs, they are the default. That is the meat and potatoes, as they say. The garnishings, and it will be the voluntary prayers. The voluntary actions, the voluntary deeds. So we have to establish, if a person establishes the obligatory affairs, and then they do the recommended affairs, the voluntary deeds, they will, if they stay consistent upon that, they will do that until Allah loves them. Until Allah loves them. Now listen to this. Allah Ta'ala, he goes on to say, and again, we're going to come back to this, but this is just for now. Allah Ta'ala, he goes on to say, فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتُهُ So, when I love him, once I have loved them, meaning him or her, Kuntu, then Kuntu Sam'ahu Ladi Yasma'u Bihi, then I will be his hearing by way in which he hears. And I will be his sight by which he sees. And I will be his hand by way in which he utilizes and he grabs. 
وَرِجَلَهُ الَّتِي يَمْشِي بِهَا And I will be his legs by way in which they walk. وَلَئِنْ سَأَلَنِي لَأُعْطِيَنَّهُ And if he asks me, I will definitely give him. They will have whatever they ask for. وَلَئِنْ إِسْتَعَاذَنِي لَأُعِيذَنَّهُ And if he asks me for protection, I will protect him. Allahu Akbar. Bithnilahi ta'ala. Again, we're going to come back to this bit by bit. But we're going to say for now, we're going to say for now, that what is meant by, I will be his hearing, by way in which he hears, his sight, by way in which he sees, his hand, by way in which he grasps, his legs, by way in which he walks, so on and so forth. What this means is that the Allah Ta'ala will guide that person to utilize his hearing in only that which will benefit them. Utilize his ears in only that which is halal. Allah Ta'ala will give them the tawfiq to turn to the halal, listen to the halal and turn away from the haram. Likewise with the sight. Allah Ta'ala will give that person the tawfiq to look at only that which is permissible and to avoid and their glance and to yeah, I mean, from that which is not permissible. To grab at and to touch and utilize their hands in only ways that are permissible and not in ways that are impermissible. To utilize their legs and walk towards things that are permissible and utilize them in the service of Allah Ta'ala's deen and not in ways and manners and walking towards that which is haram and impermissible. In general, yeah, I mean, this is okay, what, what that it means. But again, we're going to come back to it, inshallah, ta'ala. This hadith is collected by Al-Bukhari. This hadith is collected by Imam Al-Bukhari in his Sahih, in his collection of authentic hadith. The Fadil to Shaykh, the Muhaddith, Muhaddith al-Madina, Shaykh Abdul Muslim and Abdul Abad al-Badr, ta'ala, he mentions, commenting on this hadith, he says, Qawluhu ta'ala, that his statement, meaning the statement of Allah ta'ala, Man aada li, وَلِيًّا فَقَدْ أَذَنْتُهُ بِالْحَرْبِ That whoever has enmity for a wali of mine, that I have declared war on that person. Naam. The Shaykh, he mentions, he says, هذا الحديث من الأحديث القدسية He said, this hadith are from the ahadith that are Qudsi. أَلَّتِي يَرْوِيهَا الرَّسُولِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ عَنْ رَبِّهِ those narrations in which the prophets, in which the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he narrates them upon his Lord. فَقَدْ أَفْرَدَ الشَّوْكَانِ شَرْحَهُ فِي الْكِتَابِ سَمَّاهُ قَطْرَ الْوَلِي بِالشَّرْحِ الْحَدِيثِ الْوَلِي Imam al-Shawkani, to show you how tremendous this hadith is. Imam al-Shawkani, he wrote a whole book just upon this one hadith. Imam al-Shawkani, he wrote a whole book just upon this one hadith. Now, so that's important to understand that this class is not intended to give you a deep dive into the explanation of these ahadith, but it is to give you from them enough for you to understand their meanings, enough for you to be able to contemplate upon the guidance that comes therein so that you may implement them. Now, but, bila shakku bila raib, they are is, is there's there's more that could be mentioned for each for each hadith. There's more that could be mentioned. There's a more in-depth study that an individual can do. So ta'ala, this will be like what? Like the beginning. Now this will be like the beginning, the opening stages. And inshallah ta'ala, as you go on to learn, as you go on to proceed, inshallah ta'ala, this will be what you build upon. Bithnilahi ta'ala. Naam. And for those who they don't I have the opportunity to build upon it or and or the desire to build upon it then bismillah ta'ala that which you will get from here will suffice you it will be enough inshallah ta'ala ala kulli hal imam al-shawkani wrote a whole book on it which shows you this hadith is no joke this hadith is tremendous so much benefit but we're going to mention some just a little bit inshallah ta'ala the shaykh he mentions he says wal awliya allah Azza wa Jal and the awliya of Allah and this is very important and what you understand is because you got people out there especially from the Sufiya where they go too far they go too far and they make it seem like you have the awliya and then you have the regular Muslims Naam, this is what they make it seem like you have the awliya then you have the regular Muslims and this could be seen 
in their understanding, in their belief that it is possible that a wali can be better than a nabi. Naam? Yani fi za'mihim. Anna rubbama a wali yakunun afdal min a nabi. Aw nabiyan. Hatha batil. Naam? This is wrong. They say that it is possible that a wali can be better than a nabi. That a wali could be better than a nabi. A wali could be better than a prophet. Naam. How could a wali be better than a prophet? It's not possible. I'm going to explain to you why. It's not possible for a wali to be better than a prophet because, as the Sheikh mentions, Al Awliya Allah Azza wa Jal Humul Mu'minun Al Mutakarrabun Al Mutakun Afwan Humul Mu'minun Al Mutakun. That the Awliya of Allah, they are the believers who have taqwa. They are the believers who have fear and reverence for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with this we will understand that what? That every Nabi is a wali. That every prophet is a wali. Because who are the best of the believers? The prophets. Who have the most taqwa? The prophets. Who are the most God-fearing? And who are the ones who fear Allah the most? The prophets. So how would it be possible that a prophet could be a prophet but not be a wali? No way. Every prophet is a wali. So how can a wali be better than a nabi? They can't. It's not possible. Why? Because every nabi is a wali. <laughs> that makes sense. طيب وما الدليل وما الدليل أن ال ال الأولياء الأولياء الله هم المؤمنون المتقون. What is the proof that the awliya of Allah they are the believers who have taqwa? نعم. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says, "Ala in the awliya Allah la khawfun alayhim wa hum yahzanun." Allah Taala He says that, and verily the awliya of Allah, there is no fear upon them, nor will they be sad. Then Allah Taala He says, "Al ladina amanu, those who who believe al mu'minun." This is the dalil, hum al mu'minun. Those who have iman, those who believe. Right. Then Allah Ta'ala He says, وَكَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ And then they what? Then they have fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have piety, they have taqwa. Right. So this is the delil for what? That the awliya of Allah, هُمُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الْمُتَّقُونَ That they are the believers who have taqwa. Believers and they have taqwa. Then they are the awliya. So with that being the case, we understand better the statement of the ulama when he said every believer, every Muslim, every believer has a piece of wilayah. Every believer has a piece of this. Every believer is a wali to a certain extent. And you will be a better wali the more you, the better, the, the stronger your iman and the more taqwa that you have. Okay? But every believer is in the ballpark of being a what? A wali. Why? Because there's not a single believer except he believes. Not a single Muslim except he has Iman. Without Iman, you cannot be a Muslim. Naam? Without Iman, you cannot be a Muslim. So every Muslim has Iman. Now, is it conceivable to believe that there is a Muslim that has no fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Not any? None whatsoever? No. No way. How can this be? Even, a person can even think like that? Everybody has something from taqwa. There are some people who are, have more taqwa than others. Naam? There are some people who have more taqwa than others. Bila shakku bila right. But undoubtedly, the what every believer has something from taqwa. So therefore, every believer is what? Is a wali. Every believer is a wali. And the best of the awliya, man hum, al anbiya. And the best of the awliya, then they are the anbiya. Naam. The Shaykh goes on to mention after explaining who are the awliya, he says in the meaning, وَمَعْنَا أَذَنْتُهُ harb, And the meaning of, I declare war upon that person. The one who has enmity for, one, for a wali, then I declare war upon that person. What is the meaning of this? The Shaykh, he mentions, he says, أَعْلَمْتُهُ أَنَّنِي مُحَارِبٌ لَهُ He says, meaning, is that I'm making it clear to him, announcing unto him that verily I'm at war with him. Ya subhanallah Ya subhanallah Wa huwa And I want you to understand this 
the result of having enmity from one of the awliya of Allah for a believer is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be at war with you. That's serious. That's beyond serious. Because that, how can you win? Uh, that's all I can say. How can you win? Allah musta'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being at war with you is never an option for the one who has intellect. It's never an option. The Shaykh he mentions, he says, وَهُوَ يَدُلُّ عَلَى خُطُورَةِ مَعَادَةِ الْأَوْلِيَاءِ مَعَادَةِ أَوْلِيَاءِ اللَّهِ وَأَنَّهُ مِنَ الْكَبَائِرِ He said, and this points you to the danger in having enmity for the awliya of Allah in that verily it is from the major sins. Because a major sin is what? Is a sin that has attached to it punishment in this world or in the hereafter. Naam. Or a curse be upon a person. Right? That, that the la'na be upon a person, so on and so forth. What is the end result of this particular deed of having enmity and take in an, an, uh, an, an enmity for a wali? Is that Allah Ta'ala He will be at war with you. So no doubt, that's from the major sins. So we have to be very careful, very careful. How many of the people they have enmity for the for the ulama? How many of the people have enmity for the ulama? A'udhu billah. They speak bad and ill about the ulama, speak about them in disrespectful terms, belittle them, and then elevate themselves. Yeah, subhanAllah. Individuals who say things like the, the ulama, they don't know anything. The ulama, they don't understand the sharia. The ulama don't understand the sharia. And you, non-alim individual, you who are not a scholar, you understand the sharia. The ulama don't understand sharia. But you understand sharia. You put them down and, lay, and raise yourself up. Yeah, subhanallah. The ulama, they don't have courage. People talk like this. The ulama, and they, and they describe them as being cowardly. Yeah, subhanallah. The ulama don't have courage, but you have courage. Allahu musta'an. Allahu musta'an. So they have enmity, and some people, they take enmity from the ulama. Imam al-Tahawi, in Aqeed al-Tahawiyya, he mentions about the ulama, لا يذكرون إلا بالجميل ومن ذكرهم بسوء فهو على غير السبيل. That the ulama, the, the ulama of the religion, the scholars of the religion, those whom the Prophet ﷺ, he said, والعلماء ورثة الأنبياء And the ulama, they are those who inherit from the prophets. The ulama, the scholars, they are those who inherit from the prophets. They are the inheritors of the prophets, okay? But you not inheritors of the prophet, you think you better than them? Yeah, subhanAllah. Imam al-Tahawi, he says what means that, and they are only to be mentioned with good. They are not mentioned except with good. لا يذكرون إلا بالجميل They're not mentioned except with good. And whoever mentions them with evil, then he's not upon the right way. For who are ala ghayr sabi? He's not upon the right way. Whoever mentions the ulama with evil, they're not upon the right way. Wa'iyadu billah. But I want you to reflect on this. You're taking enmity to an alim from the ulama. You feel comfortable that by doing that, Allah not Allah to ask I could be at war with you. You feel comfortable by taking enmity. To the ulama, you feel comfortable that, that none of the ulama them are from the awliya because you have an enmity for the awliya results in Allah waging war upon you. So you feel comfortable that these ulama are not from the awliya, so you don't got to worry. You okay? Allah al-musta'an. Fattakullah. Fear Allah. Fear Allah. Fear Allah as relates to the treatment of the ulama. Fear Allah as relates to the treatment of the Muslims. Don't open your mouth against a Muslim. Except that there is an extreme need and cause to do so. Don't be reckless in how you speak about the Muslims. Don't be reckless in how you look upon the Muslims. Clean your heart from all of those things that will cause you to have enmity for the Muslims. Because you could be setting yourself up for the ultimate loss. That resulting in Allah Ta'ala being at war with you. And if Allah is at war with you, you will never be successful. 
اكتفي بهذا القدر وصلى الله عليه وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين وجزاكم الله خيرا